Well, good morning, everyone. It is 1103, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a, a quick note is that when you come in, you should be muted automatically. And if you're not, go ahead and mute your microphone unless you um, plan to talk. Otherwise, it can get, there can be a lot of background noise. Uh, my name is Denise Demisi. I'm the Director of Faculty Development for the University System of Georgia. And I'm happy to welcome you to our third webinar in the series, uh, Online Course Design and Course Planning with Josie Baudier of Georgia Highlands College. Um, and of note, this one is scheduled to go till 1215. It's a little longer than the other ones. So we hope you guys will be able to stick around for the whole session, but we also understand if you have to check out early. And with that, I will turn it over to Josie. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all here. I have to admit, I'm a little um, intimidated at this moment um, because, um, yeah, 167 people is, you know, that's exciting stuff in a webinar in June, <laughs> at the end of June, after the semester and the summer that we've all had. So I really appreciate you all being here. I hope that in this webinar that you walk away with at least one great idea that you can implement in the fall or maybe in your summer courses. It's hard to deliver an informational webinar, but try to also make it engaging, especially with this group, with a large number like this. Um, but I know you're all faculty, so you're ready to, or at least um, active staff with students, and so you're ready to participate. And uh, <laughs> I, um, I'm gonna turn off my camera while I deliver the webinar. I do have um, moments where I'm gonna ask you to speak or write in the chat window, so I will pay attention to those. Um, that's going to be our way of communicating today. But I will turn off my um, camera because I want to read my notes, and I have a dog, and, and I'm not, I can't make an excuse for her. I have a cup. Look, I have a chew toy right here ready to go. Um, I, there's one back there ready to go, but if she, I'm the only one here. So if she barks. I'm sorry, but she's a sweetheart, so we can't really uh, fault her for it too much. So, um, Again, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that um, we can continue this conversation offline. Feel free to reach out to me um, through, with my email address that Denise probably provided somewhere. If not, you can find me at Georgia Highlands College. I am the director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Georgia Highlands. We are right now a center of one, but in a few weeks, we're gonna be a center of two. I'm pretty excited about that. And like most of you all, we, um, not most of you, like all of you, we went remote in the spring very quickly. And then in the summer, we are now fully online and we are making plans for our fall, just like all of you. <laughs> I don't know what those plans are. <laughs> I don't want to share what those plans are right now. I think <laughs> it's the best way to say that. But um, as you start building your courses out, if you want someone to turn to that is um, a different eye that usually looks at your courses, feel free to reach out. I am available for your, for your um, assistance whenever you need it. So this is what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to look at some, we're gonna talk about situational factors and I try to identify a few. We are going to talk about the basics of course design, which include alignment, organization, engagement, and learner support. And we are also going to talk a little bit about synchronous engagement because I know that seems to be um, an area where a lot of us are struggling. And then also, I'm gonna provide you with some documents and ideas on how to start planning throughout the, um, throughout the uh, for the semester. So if you wanna communicate with me, as Denise mentioned, you can use the chat, which you have all found, it looks like. <laughs> and um, feel free to type in there. Ch Denise will be checking into the chat area, and so will I. But um, if you if have a, a pressing question, you can uh, raise your hand, which is found below um, or pressing comment. It's found below the participant list. You should have the raise your hand button and I might ask you to do some yes, no checks throughout the presentation. So you have all that right there. Try to locate it now. It's at the bottom of the participant list. And okay, so that seems to be good. Um, so let's get going. I'm gonna use my arrow so you don't have to hear my clicks on the recording. Is this, you got it recording? Cause I can't see that part, Denise. If you don't have a recording, hit record. <laughs> I do have it recording. Okay. <laughs> so I took this data from the information that Denise gave me about a week ago to, um, so, so, to know what my audience was. And I wanted to share that with you. Normally this is something I would use a polling tool for and in 
if you're familiar with Zoom or Collaborate, both of those have polling options um, for these synchronous type of um, delivery. So right here in front of you, uh, we see that we've got mostly biology, English, and science represented here. And mostly full-time faculty members have registered. That may not be all that's here, but mostly full-time faculty have registered. And then look at the experience. So when I wrote the description, I said, for those of you who are new to online learning, but we've got everybody here. <laughs> so please, if you have been doing online learning for quite a while and you feel comfortable sharing your ideas and thoughts, this is the time you know, to do it. Feel free to do it during this time, um, either in the chat, raising your hand, and um, we'll, walk, we'll work through it all. My plan was to deliver for about, you know, and then talk to you for about an hour and then leave that last 15 minutes for questions. But like Denise said, if you can't stick around, send us questions through email, we will get back to you. I, I think Denise will address the private recordings in just a second, but that's a great question. So um, let's take a second right here and do a little brainstorm to get warmed up. And what I want you to do, before you write anything in the chat window about this, <laughs> I want you to stop and think of three things you do when you are planning a party or a vacation in non-COVID times, non-coronavirus times. So um, what were some of the things you did when you were planning a party or a vacation? And I want you to think for a moment, don't write anything at all, Write it down on your own scratch piece of paper for your own eyes and then wait. So I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds. Okay, so normally um, I would call on someone. <laughs> But I'm going to try a different tactic uh, today since we have so many people in here. Um, yeah, someone said, what is a vacation in the chat window, right? So this is no, what we're about to plan for in the fall is no vacation. What we planned for in the spring, the summer was no vacation. It was no party. I know that. And um, there are a lot of times when we have uh, restrictions around what we're planning, like we do right now for our course design, right? We don't really know what the fall might hold for some of us. Uh, some of us might be asked to deliver a course in a way we didn't really expect or want to. And so the, the, what usually frames our course design and our motivation to talk to our students and teach our students, what really frames that is not in place anymore. And we're more or less instructed and um, by not just the Department of Public Health and the CDC, but also USG um, on how we can deliver our courses. So they have a lot of parameters around planning for the fall but when you normally plan so i want to hear from some of you i want to hear what your answers are when you normally plan for a party or vacation what are three things that you do to to do that and i would like if you have a dog named max i would like you to write in the chat window uh, odds are in 182 people we have a dog named max <laughs> debbie thank you debbie i appreciate that i'm glad you're here um make a list ellen said Check my calendar, so looking for dates. What kind of list do you make, Debbie? Susan, she said she plans the destination. Plans activities. Deborah, thank you. Willie, plans fun activities. Considers a time things to do. List of things to do, need to prepare, purchase items. So you can just see in a group of 182, how many people have a dog named Max? So this is one strategy you can use when you're delivering your synchronous uh, engagement to your students, your synchronous courses to your students. I also go with like birthdays. I would have my students in a class of 20 raise their hand and I would ask them to speak. Or if you've got a nice comfortable group and community has already been built, trust is already there, just have them talk without having to raise their hand. Um, think about what people will engage with. That's good, Sarah, thanks. Budget. <laughs> I don't want to hear that word right now, justice. <laughs> um, define the purpose. Okay, so I feel like you guys are heading down my path right now. You know where I'm going with this. Um, so when we plan for our parties and our vacations, we are looking at a couple of things. We are thinking about that end goal. What is the, what is the part, point of the party? Is it there, are we there for an event? 
Are we there to have a dinner? Are we there to celebrate something? So we always have to have that plan for the party. And then what the party is happening or the vacation is happening, we want to know what's going to be going on in between. Like, do I get to go fishing with my partner? Do I, um, on my vacation, is it just going to be the two of us? Or does the, do one of you gets to go fishing with one of the children? Or during the party, you know, is there going to be an opportunity for your groups to mingle? Who do you invite to that party, right? That's a big question. Um, so we have to really think about and plan for all of these different types of things to happen. And you can see how this kind of relates to our course um, de design as we move forward. Situational factors really come into play here. And that's kind of where we were headed with planning for this party and this vacation. What else can be affecting those types of things? What else can be affecting our course design um, that we really have no control over? So that's what a situational factor is. It's something that um, we have to know in order to design our course, but it's also something we have no control over changing. So here uh, is a list from Fink, uh, D. Fink, who um, really is this, um, the, the legend or whatever they, of, of situational factors. And I'm gonna show you how this factors into your course design in a moment, but he points to a couple of things. And this is just a short list. This isn't in all that he talked about when it comes to situational factors, but one of the things here on this list is how will the course be developed? How will the, how will the course be delivered? And um, that is a big problem for us right now, right? So that, that's really why we're here and seeking all of this information. A lot of us are not familiar with remote instruction or online instruction and synchronous teaching. And so how is this course gonna be delivered is top of the list. We have to also turn to our accrediting bodies. I know that at the end of the semester in the spring, we had a lot of issues with who was qualified to graduate in some of our health sciences. Um, the, and then there had to be some type of um, compromise made. If you look at um, the characteristics of the learners or the characteristics of the teachers, a big situational factor for us here is the virus. And what's the health of your students? What's the health of the instructor? Um, and how does that play into the delivery of the course and the course design? So we cannot really purposefully plan our course until we know these factors. And so this is step one when we're designing a course, thinking about these, situational, these types of situational factors. So my question to you then is this, try to, in the chat area, think about one specific situational factor that you feel is going to affect your instruction or your course design in the fall. What is one, and I'll put it back the screen uh, before this so you can see Fink's list again, but think about one thing that you really feel is going to affect, of course the virus. <laughs> of course the virus. What specifically is going to affect your instruction in the fall? And I'm gonna read the list uh, on the chat right now. Technology, expectation of developing essentially two courses for, for one section. Someone says how I'm going to be told how to deliver my course. Yeah, that's a big issue for a lot of people, class size. Labs, big, big problem with labs, I know. So technology, we've already seen those huge gaps in inequality of, um, of our technology for not just the students, but also the faculty. At least that's what we've, I've experienced. So you can see what you've done here. <laughs> you have already started step one of the course design process. You have already started to think about what's gonna affect your course design in the fall. And this is perfect, okay? Now I'm gonna take a, a moment to share with you a few things that I think also will affect your course design. And some of you have already touched on, which is the delivery modality. I mean, we all um, struggle with um, change and that's what happened in March and we had no choice but to, and, and also the summer, no choice but to essentially try to keep a continuity of learning going in a similar fashion um, and continue to deliver in a different modality. It's very difficult. I'm gonna talk about that thinking process, that mindset shift in just a moment. 
flexibility. This is really talking about like, like I mentioned earlier, your accrediting bodies, your institution, they have to be flexible in some of the ways that we're delivering instruction, but also, um, you know, student communication is a big deal. That's my next one. Um, and thinking about um, how you're going to be flexible in your, maybe your assessments. Maybe you had to rethink some assessments in the, in the spring and now it's time to really um, put some effort into making sure those are meaningful assessments. So a lot of flexibility in the next uh, semester. And then this is a big issue I think for a lot of us is the communication. I saw a lot of people touch on that in the chat window. Um, this is a bit going to be a situational factor that we're going to have to really spend some time thinking about how do I communicate with my students and how do my students get in touch with me. And it can't just simply be the only answer is by phone or the only answer is by email. We have to go back to flexibility and delivery modality to think about how that communication is going to happen. So here is um, what I've been talking to my faculty about. And I developed this little, <laughs> um, this little uh, image right here, this, this movement here uh, on my own, taking in so many people's work. And um, it started basically in this, we started in, this, in the spring with this quick jump to remote instruction um, and, and offering that continuity. And that's where we really turned to a lot of the synchronous modalities because we have so many people who teach face-to-face -face and we felt like the easiest thing to do would be to put them in a synchronous format like Zoom and have them continue their lectures. Um, but we saw so many problems with that, right? Not just technology inequalities, but, but um, capabilities and, and, and skill level and comfort level and anxiety and so much stuff happened. Uh, whenever we, we tried that method of, of quick remote instruction. Well, guess what? We have a moment here to breathe. We have a few months while you're teaching in the summer, probably. <laughs> you have a few months to start to shift to this more digital mindset. Um, I read an article and it's cited here and it's in my reference sheet. And it was basically about um, uh, our um, business world, our corporate world, um, and how they're shifting more into this digital mindset. And and thinking about uh, remote working and stuff like that more than they ever have in the past. And I think this is a great um, stepping stone for us to really think about what our course could be in a new modality. And so that's where we get to the, the end of this, this stepping stone here, this arrow, this movement, whatever you wanna call it, is where we have a moment this summer maybe to reimagine what our course could be in the fall and our delivery options and really put some time into this purposeful, intentional course design plan. Um, it does take time. It does take a lot of time. So check my time, by the way. <laughs> um, course design is defined for us, and I'm going to give you some steps um, to walk through um, in just a moment. But uh, when, when you say, when you ask someone, how do you design your course, if they haven't really thought about it, a lot of times the, the answer is, um, well, I looked at the chapters or the topics in my course, and I chose the weeks I'm gonna teach each one of them and I'm given three exams and then a final. And that's that. And you could say that answer for, you know, anyone could say that answer for an online course or a face-to-face -face course. Um, but, and that's the 30 minute answer of course design, but that's really not digging into what course design is. And so we really have to think about and be intentional about where to start and how to move through the process of designing a whole course. And to your surprise, maybe to your surprise, I don't know, our researchers, our learning scientists tell us that the last step in course design is writing a syllabus. The last step is writing the syllabus, or one of the last steps, I should say, <laughs> because they're Fink and Makichi kind of go back and forth if it's the last or the second to last step. But, um, really thinking about that whole process and, and, you know, mapping it out, storyboarding it. I have some documents I'll share with you all to um, do this process, but I have seen people post it, noted on their walls, whiteboard it so that they can erase and move things around. There's millions of ways to physically course design. But before we step into our traditional course design methods, we have to think about what's happening in the fall, right? We have to think about what's happening right now with uh, a pandemic. And a lot of people have been doing some writing about resilient teaching or resilient pedagogy. I've heard both names, but this citation I have here is resilient teaching. Um, and again, it's cited at the end so you can read it for yourself. But um, there is 
this, um, actually was asked this question today at 8, 8.30 in the morning in a leadership meeting that said, you know, how do we plan for what happens, at, you know, in the fall? And um, resilient pedagogy is telling us that we have to plan with the idea that there will be an unstable or disruptive a disruption in our learning environment. That we have to plan for that possibility that we're all gonna have to go from whatever modality we're doing to an online environment because of the pandemic. So we have to start doing that now with our course design. Things need to be written in the syllabus, things need to be implemented in the course. Um, and so by addressing it now, planning for it now, uh, we will be more prepared for it when it does happen. Even though I feel like we're gonna be more prepared for it anyway, because we dealt with what we dealt with in the spring, I think now is the time to really write it into your course design. What is your plan for this disruption, um, this possible disruption in the learning environment in the fall? We have to let our course goals continue to drive that um, plan. Those course goals give us the purpose for teaching. They give students the purpose for being in that classroom and the purpose really motivates us as faculty and as students. We really need to let those course goals drive that instruction. And then finally, um, in resilient teaching, of course, we need to figure out how we're gonna do this differently. It's not gonna look the same. Um, I have this great quote, I'm gonna read it real, quote, real quick for you all. It says that um, um, this shift to the, to the synchronous environment where so many of us are delivering um, in the format like I'm doing now, we should be using that environment more to show empathy, answer questions, challenge students, and praise their successes than to just deliver, like I'm doing right now, an informational session, to just lecture to our students. We really should be using these synchronous moments to create that human contact, if you will, with students as much as we possibly can. And then take a moment and think about this. If we did this stuff, if we considered ahead of time and purposefully planned how much more accessible and inclusive our teaching will be to our students, which is probably where we should have been in the first place, right? But it takes some times like this, this huge shift for us to really, you know, get hit in the face and realize how accessible and how inclusive our teaching really is. So if we really consider about, uh, take into consideration what could happen in the fall and a huge disruption and a shift, and we really plan for it and consciously think about our course design while doing that, uh, we're gonna create this more inclusive and accessible course. So basics of course design, here you go. Alignment, organization, engagement, learner support. I mean, I'm gonna run through them all for you. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, um, oh, I can't pronounce your name, uh, uh, Alvina maybe. Alvina said, we also have to plan for not just our course moving modalities, but maybe our students before our course moves modalities. So our students that, yeah, <laughs> our students that, um, you know, whatever reason, are caregivers or they themselves get ill or ill or something happens where they can no longer attend in whatever mode you're delivering. So we have to be flexible and ready for that as well. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Ellen, you contact me about that and I will be happy to share. Okay, so let's talk about, oops, sorry, that was a pretty picture. Let's talk about alignment real quick. So alignment, uh, first of all, all four of these things that I'm about to talk about could be, you know, hours, webinars, for, and workshops for you all, but I'm going to scratch the service here. Again, call me, email me if you want more. Um, alignment is uh, making sure that the critical course components are connected. And so what that means is that we are um, not wasting anyone's time in class. We are purposely planning for the achievement of the course goals in everything we do. No busy work no random tests that make no sense, no activities that are not connected to any course goal. So we are really conscious about what we teach our students. And this is, you know, very important in the world that we're in now. There's no time for anything extra. So the first step in uh, what we call backward design is um, identifying your desired results. So backward design is a course design model. Thinks integrated course design is another course design model. Um, I'm going to start with backward design and then I'm going to show you a little bit about think and you'll see how they're very similar. So backward design, the first step is identifying the desired results. Well, what does that mean? Uh, essentially, that means we need to make sure we know what the goals of the course are. 
we need to know what the course objectives are, and we should even narrow it down into what are we doing each week? What are our objectives for each week or each module or each chunk of topic or unit that you, that you teach? We really need to get, go from that broad course goal objective to down to our specific weekly objective so we understand exactly what the result is. What is the goal of doing this? It takes us to a place called endearing understandings and what we really want our students to take away from the course a year or five years after it's over. So thinking about really what, you know, the connection to the professional world, the connection that's relevant to them, the connection to the next um, moment in their life. In Highlands, we have a lot of students that are with us for two years and then go on to a four-year institution. So we have to really think about planning for that pathway into that four-year institution. So what are those enduring understandings? What are the desired results? In this case, if we're talking about this cupcake, the desired result would be that this would be a delicious cupcake in the end. Okay, let's see where I take you with this cupcake. Step two is to determine the acceptable evidence. So that means that we have the goals, we know what we want them to do, but now we need to determine what is acceptable as mastery of those goals. How do, we, how do the students show us that they know that, that, that they've met those goals? And that is in our assessments. So we wanna make sure that we are having students do something that can be measured and we can say, okay, if they've done this, then they've accomplished that goal, check. Moving on to the next one. What else can they do? And this can be a formative assessment, but generally speaking, this is summative assessments, you know, big assessments that are going to really align to those main course goals. You know, in this picture, we see this child is eating the cupcake. And we could say that that's kind of acceptable evidence, at least it's yummy. I mean, that's, she doesn't really have a smile on her face, but at least it looks like she's enjoyed it because it's all over her face. <laughs> So her, my acceptable evidence here would be that she enjoyed the cupcake. Um, but for our students, this is not just going to be three exams and a final. Our students are going to have to really, or we're going to have to really plan some meaningful assessments that align to those course goals. Go back to your course goals. Find your course goals in your syllabus that someone gave you years ago. <laughs> Read them. <laughs> Double check with your dean in your chair that they're actually still relevant, then they're still the right goals. And then, and then go back and say, okay, how am I finding out that these students have mastered these goals. What am I testing them on? What, is their, what are their assessments? And then your third step is, all right, I'm handing the dog the bone now. She's getting frisky. Um, the third step is planning for those learning experiences. So right here we have the recipe, the baker use the recipe to make that wonderful cupcake that that's, that, that child enjoyed. Um, but these are your learning activities. This is the support that you're giving your students to use, to practice, get feedback from you, to um, uh, possibly get a grade on some type of a low stake situation before they go into those big tests and big papers and essays that they have to write. So these are those little scaffolded or stepping stone moments for your students to learn um, from, you know, learn from practicing. Um, and then, and then we can measure them and tell them they're on the right track, they're on the wrong track, um, and how to help them improve. And all that comes with feedback. And remember, feedback isn't just a grade. Feedback just needs to sometimes be words to your students. So while quizzing them in the 10-point quizzes every week is very beneficial, you want them to dig a little bit deeper because I imagine your exams aren't um, basic levels of cognition, that you're really asking them probably higher level thinking in your exams. So go back and make sure that your learning experiences actually support mastery of the exams and the mastery of those goals. So that's alignment in a nutshell. It's very, it's not easy. It's not, this is not easy to do. Um, and, and sometimes I hear faculty say like, I really got the handle in the beginning, but then the end of my class, um, I feel like I was completely, it was all misaligned and all over the place. And that happens. Take the time, reflect, make a moment to, make changes and take it chunk by chunk. Sometimes that's all we can do. So when you're aligning your course, I like to use a tool like this, and I have some more of these that I'm gonna share at the end with you, where you would write, let's see if I can get my pen going. Oh, we need a different color. Oh no, I have to use my favorite color. Um, where you would write your objective and then Decide on the assessments that measure that objective, measure that objective. 
What are they going to do? And then what are the learning activities that you're going to give them that support, you know, passing that exam, let's say, and mastering that objective, let's say. So you can see where it's a, it seems to be a linear process. Fink takes it out of a linear process, and I'll show you his model in just a moment. But um, this is, um, this is uh, one chart that you could use, let's say. Um, but anyway, so here's an example. So if an example for this objective is um, identify course components, um, identify components of a persuasive speech, and the assessment is deliver a speech, is that aligned? This is a very simple, <laughs> thanks Amy, this is a very simple answer here. <laughs> Identifying components of a persuasive speech and then the assessment is deliver a speech. Is this aligned? Y'all type it in the chat window for me. No one wants to go first. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> or, oh, oh, Mark, I, I saw you were popped in before Carl. Okay, correct. Yeah, so um, I'm not, I, if you teach speech, I apologize. <laughs> I was trying to find something, you know, that may not cause too much uh, angst in the, in the question. So basically, no, it's not aligned, okay? Um, you want them to identify components of speech, if that's the objective, then they should list it. They should um, be tested, they can identify it through a matching. Um, so there could be many, many ways they do it. Um, delivering the speech is not one of them. So this is a common misalignment that I see where the objective is actually delivering the speech or it's not even a component of the, of the objective, but the assessment is. Um, so uh, oftentimes I see um, where they, you know, an instructor says, okay, so we're gonna learn all these things and these are all your objectives, identifying the speech, making the outline, delivering the speech, but there are no learning activities aligned to all those other components of identifying and outlining. And all they do is deliver the speech in the end. So if it's an objective to identify, then somewhere they need to be identifying those components. <laughs> Thank you. Deliver persuasive speech would, better be would be better aligned. That's right. So and here, that actually brings up a good point. So a lot of times my faculty say to me, well, this is the assessment they have to have. And I said, well, that's wonderful, but that's not an objective that you have. And we, a lot of the times we are given the objectives and we have no control over making changes to those course level objectives, those large course level objectives that have to run through a curriculum committee. Um, and so I always tell them like, you can't go that way backwards. You can't say, this is the assessment I want. Let's make it fit these objectives. It has to go in the direction, the other direction where if there is an objective, what is the aligned assessment? Um, so anyway, this is the integrated course design model by Fink. Uh, so you can see he has similar uh, main areas and steps. He talks about learning goals at the, at the top of that pyramid that really dictate everything. And then feedback and assessment and teaching and learning are on a similar plane. And you can see his situational factors that affect the whole course design. You can see that right there in that graphic. Now Fink does say, if you read deep into his um, model, he does say that feedback and assessment need to happen before the uh, teaching and learning, uh, to support the teaching and learning activities. So we need to really think about planning those assessments and the feedback that we're giving our students in conjunction with the teaching and learning of activities. So if you were to break one of these um, lines on this triangle, the, one of these integrated lines on this triangle, for instance, if you were to break the connection between the assessment and the learning goals, then essentially students would be failing, uh, sorry, if you were to break the, uh, the line between assessment and learning goals, then students would not be being assessed on the goals of the course. They would be being assessed on something random, something that didn't matter to the goals of the course. So if you were to break the alignment between the activities and the feedback, students might be doing too much busy work and not being able to pass your exams. Um, or n unaligned, meaningless work and not be able to pass your exams. So there's the integrated course design model compared to the backward design model. Either work, both are great, they're well researched. Um, <laughs> uh, this is my reminder to you all that you want to evaluate every phase. So while you're looking at the course goals, while you're looking at the assessments and the learning activities, remember I mentioned earlier how sometimes faculty say like I did very well at the beginning of semester and then I fell off. As you're planning your whole semester now, think about 
uh, evaluating at each of these phases and making changes at each of these phases. Don't wait till the end of the semester. Um, a course, I'm gonna say this and I know you're all gonna fuss, <laughs> but a course should be planned before it is taught. Before the course goes live, the course should be planned and designed and ready for delivery on day one of the, of the uh, semester. Now, things happen. We saw it happen in the spring. Things, plans change. You get ill. Someone else is ill. Uh, beyond the virus, anything could happen, you know? Um, and so then you have to punt, make changes then. But um, plan your course ahead of time. Then three or four weeks in, evaluate it with your students. You know, send them a message and say like, I'm evaluating right now too. Um, I want you to send me feedback about my course. Three or four more weeks into the semester, do it again. Ask for some more feedback from the students. How are things going? What am I doing that's helping you? What am I doing that's not helping you? What could I do better? Um, ask them those questions and do it in an anonymous survey. You have all access to it probably in your learning management system. Um, or if not, you can use uh, Microsoft Forms if you're using Microsoft 365. So evaluate yourself at every phase, evaluate yourself through the semester, ask your students to evaluate your course. It's the only way we're gonna know if we're on the right track. All right, we're gonna move to organization. I'm talking about course organization and clarifying our expectations. I have some great examples at the end of this section for you. So I have to mention Quality Matters because it's a wonderful product USG, uh, most USG institutions subscribe to Quality Matters for a very discounted rate. It's a great product. If you hadn't had, haven't had a moment to check it out, um, talk to your CEDL director or talk to your uh, dean or chair and find out if you have a subscription, if you have access to the rubric and uh, do so. The rubric is um, about 41 standards that help to measure quality online course design. So is my course designed and ready to go for delivery? Um, I know that the, this webinar series is offering a Quality Matters, Online Quality Matters workshop. Um, if, if you can get it there, get it there because it'll be in-house price. Um, even with your subscription, you should be paying in-house price. But there are so many people that do these workshops throughout the system. Contact Denise and I'm sure she'll connect you with someone. I know Highlands is planning to do one for the faculty, for our faculty at the end of July. And if we have spots open, I'll reach out to, to Denise and have her offer it up, uh, out to uh, other USG faculty. So this is quality online course design. That's what Quality Matters looks at, wonderful rubric. When we are talking about organizing an online course, there is a distinction to be made. I'm not gonna use my <laughs> annotation tool even though I really want to. <laughs> there is a distinction to be made between modular course design and individual folders. Uh, yes, I'll share my slides. Um, modular course design is what I have an example of in front of you right now. And I'm going to take you through what this could look like for you in just a moment. The individual folders is kind of where we were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, maybe some of you started teaching WebCT was our learning management system, or at least in Tennessee it was. And then Vista was the last one here in Georgia, I believe. And we used to put things in folders that uh, where students had to go into each folder each week to get the stuff they needed. They went in to get PowerPoint. They went in to get notes. They went to another folder to get um, the quiz. They went into another folder to get an assignment. They went to another folder to get, you know, additional content material. But instead, we've learned the more intuitive way to design an online course is using modular course organization. So what that looks like is in the overall course organization, you might have a start here area where you would include some of these things that I have on the slide. Then you would have your learning modules, which could be divided by weeks, which could be divided by topic or themes. I heard something the other day, someone said they were teaching a communication class and they were using themes that had to do with Star Wars, I believe, just to make it more exciting for the students. Um, I thought, well, that to me, that bothers me because it has to, to me, it has to do with your, needs to do with your content. but this person was really excited about his Star Wars modules. So I was letting it happen. Um, but anyway, your learning modules, like I said, chunk it out somehow, week, topic, unit, whatever it is. And then you might want to provide supplemental resources to your students. Some people provide those resources within each learning module. And then um, wrap up the course in the end with a summary, a recap, an evaluation. Um, of, of it all for the students, you know, go above and beyond your uh, institutional um, in the semester 
evaluation and ask students meaningful questions about your course and your course objectives and what they learned. Now, if we are just to look at the modules, each module can be designed in a specific way. So a familiar way to do that is right here in front of you where you've got um, a module introduction, an overview, excuse me, an overview page that includes uh, like a content introduction. It could be a quick one minute video, it could be a paragraph, something to get students excited and ready to learn that, that in that module, your objectives for that module and their tasks for that module. And then the next set would be um, all the content that you want to deliver in whatever modality or whatever way you choose and then provide them the assessments and the assignments next. And then I always like to end with a what's next, even though a lot of times it is redundant, go on to the next week, make sure you've done X, Y, and Z, um, make sure you're ready for the exam or the reminder of a huge project that's coming up or something like that. Um, I still like the what's next because it tells them it's the class isn't over, there's something more to do, keep going. And this is a um, template or a lesson plan that I like to use uh, to, model that um, organization. So I um, will provide that for you too. All right. When we're talking about clarity and expectations, especially right now during COVID and what's going on with our students, this is extremely important. A lot of times you see this stuff in your syllabus, but um, a huge part of organization is being clear about expectations, Talk, telling them how often to check into their learning management system. Telling them the expectations of them, like I want you to be on class on time. If we were meeting face to face, I don't allow you to use your cell phone, you know, things like that. But also tell them expectations of yourself. So I like to word it as expectations of you, expectations of me. And the expectations you can think of, the expectations you can expect of me, the instructor, are conducting office hours, being there to answer questions, being prompt, being prepared grading and providing feedback when I tell you I'm going to. So I'm not asking you to <laughs> lay out any additional expectations. It's just when you word it in this way, it creates a partnership in learning, which tells the student that you're there for them, right? It helps with the motivation and the, the, the expectancy that they're going to succeed in your class. So we have to really think about that partnership, especially now um, when their students are so uncertain about what's gonna happen in the fall. Other expectations you might want to consider right here on the board, on the screen in front of you, um, thinking about resilient teaching and how, um, what required materials you're going to ask of your students and how can they prepare now or at the beginning of the semester for what might come later. So while you might be teaching a small class face-to-face, -face, you need to address that students should be accessing and have access to their learning management system. Um, and Zoom and how to use those tools. So you might want to test that out before, you know, October, let's just, I'm just going to say October. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just going to suggest it. <laughs> Here are two good examples that I found on Twitter this past week. Um, if you, I have my Twitter handle at the end of this um, presentation. I follow some really great people in faculty development. And so feel free to see who I follow and go out there and search for them. Um, Yes, yes, I will. Um, uh, <laughs> so yes, both Robert and um, Ms. and Rodriguez. Yes, I can't pronounce your first name. We probably as I don't want to mess it up. Um, I'm going to do that. Yes. Uh, so here's a wonderful example of a graphic a graphic design for students to see what am I supposed to do each week. Monday is a concept check. Tuesday I have a journal. Wednesday we meet synchronously. Thursday, there's a discussion. And then Sunday, I have to finish up my, all my assignments. So this is a great way to graphically explain to your students how to do this. This was built in a tool called Canva, C-A-N-V-A. And it is um, free for you know some limitations, but free. Here's another way to talk to your students about your expectations. This is uh, on your own, what you're gonna be doing. And then as, as a class, what you're gonna be doing. So again, uh, this was made in Adobe Spark, um, but again, this is just graphic ways of displaying to your students what's going to happen. This is more general about the class to me. The one prior to this was very specific. It was a weekly plan, so I like them both. 
Um, what additional expectations did you plan in the spring or the summer that I did not mention? Thank you all for uh, chiming in here. I don't author, author that's a great question, Arthur. Um, make sure that these graphics are accessible. So sometimes whenever we do these, they come out as images, but sometimes, um, oh, hang on here. Sometimes um, we can attach a PDF that can be read by a screen reader. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. I don't know if the answers are coming in later or not, <laughs> but anyway, I'm gonna keep on moving forward. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little about course and student engagement. So, oh my goodness, synchronous engagement. What I'm doing right now is not engagement. <laughs> I know that, but I'm trying to make sure that we cover as much as course design as we possibly can. Uh, here are some great ideas for synchronous engagement. Um, most tools like Zoom or Collaborate, which I think the majority of us are using, um, polling breakout rooms and whiteboards. I've seen some great work where people are, you know, if you're gonna use the break, breakout rooms, you need to really spe specify what the students need to be doing in those rooms and then go check up on them. <laughs> and then uh, have them come back out and share whether they use the text on the whiteboard or they write on the whiteboard or whatever the case is and, and really hold them accountable, not just break out because for fun. Um, teams, oh, I forgot about teams. Thanks, George. Um, Collaborating on documents while in the synchronous environment, that's really uh, been fun. I've seen a small class of about 12 in American government do that. Uh, concept mapping, also collaborative concept mapping can get very interesting. Um, here's some great ideas. When you are opening your synchronous session, have a splash screen that says like, welcome, maybe play some music and get your students cued into that. So then when you turn it off, they're ready to go. And then also, um, you know, use that time to review those expectations, really make that human connection like we had talked about earlier today. And then look at this idea. You have the option to let everyone in at once, kind of like Denise did to today, create that braiding room and then let everyone at once and then begin class. Or you can um, immediately move students into breakout rooms of like four or five students and have them, you know, talk and chat just like they would if they walked into the classroom. And then they would just have like a moment to like just say hi to whoever in that little room and be casual about it before starting the, um, the main class. I thought that was a great idea. Of course, I think a lot of this comes, you have to really build this into a class, really create that community um, feel from the very beginning. Um, and then during your synchronous session, think about using videos of scenarios or simulations, case studies or videos to drive discussions and then Sometimes let students come in and lead discussions. Spe specify specific students to look for specific things related to the content, have them come with questions and have them lead a whole class discussion. Um, and in the end, make you know you could do an exit ticket, which could be something in the chat window or a poll or something to that effect. Um, I've even seen faculty you know use Kahoot in the synchronous environment or something like that. So. And a synchronous tool that we don't always think of is the phone. You know, you can't find them, you're worried about them. There's a phone number there to find them, more than an email address. So you can always do a check-in using the phone. I'm gonna skip this moment, but we can come back to it at the end if we have time. Uh, in the asynchronous environment, which more of us are probably used to, um, but I will mention a few things here in screen captures. Um, when you want to explain something to your students, like how to work a website, how to run a simulation, you know, screen capture directions are perfect. That's how I talk to most of my faculty. <laughs> they ask me, how do you do this in D2L? I will screen capture a five minute casual as much as I can. So um, also recorded lecturettes, lecturette meaning small, short, somewhere around no more than 15 minutes. Um, hide little Easter eggs in there, asking students questions and having them respond to a discussion board or send you an email with that answer. So little Easter eggs that make students search for these things that they want to find. I'm not saying alpha extra points, but it could be part of a participation grade. Using video tools like TED Talks, very accessible, but very um, professionally done. 
podcast, audio only podcast, you can make those using a tool called Audacity for free. Students love to hear you <laughs> more than they love to read about you sometimes. Um, learning objects like uh, from Merlot.org, Merlot like the wine.org is um, a great place to find tools that can support, these are places to find learning activities to support your assessments. And then don't forget about good old discussion boards. So I'm, we all have a love-hate relationship with them. I am telling you a good discussion board, I think we have a, a USG webinar on this. It's all in the prompt. <laughs> I think the person that's doing that presentation is in this presentation right now. Think about your prompt. What are you asking students to answer? And how is that relevant to them and to the content? I always like to write a question that I'm, where I'm gonna get a different answer from each student because of their own experiences. So think about the prompt and what we're asking students in those discussion boards and it'll be fun. These are three student interactions that we need to consider in our class. We need engagement between students that encourages motivation. Motivation helps with persistence student to content interaction. So we do this a lot. We have them read, we have them do individual quizzes. That's probably not an area where we're all lacking. And then student to instructor. So you post a discussion board in those online discussions for asynchronous learning. You need to be in there talking with your students as well, having conversations with them, asking more questions, having them interact with other students by directing them to other discussion boards. Um, and then also student to instructor feedback, student to instructor comes with in the feedback, you know, that we give our students. So consider those three areas of interaction when you're designing your course. So here's back to my alignment chart and then reminding you to include the engagement in those learning activities. Think about those three types of interactions. And then coming up to close, I know I have three minutes ish, um, learner support. You want to make sure that you provide this to your students. You have to include this in your course design. It is um, necessary for them, not just because they might need it at some point, IT help, but it also tells students that you care, that you care about services like financial aid, that you care about Veterans Affairs or the tutoring center. So you want to make sure they understand you as a whole person, where you're coming from, the support you want to lend them and link to these particular areas in your own institution. Um, one of the things that our, fact, my, our um, accommodation center did early on and in the spring was to create a faculty guide for online accommodations, specifically for online accommodations. Very short, it probably wasn't anything new to those people that wrote it, <laughs> but boy, it helped our, our faculty when they were moving online, it really did help them um, so, you know, things like that, like just that, uh, cl clearly that's a faculty guide, it's not a student guide, but anyway, in there, there's juicy stuff for the students. Um, so this is something I would actually include in my online course in a module. You know, I would you, label it student support and link to a lot of these places. It's not simply good enough to just link. You do need to tell your students what each of these areas are there for. You need to annotate those links, let's say. Most importantly, IT right now, students really need to know where to get the additional technology support. So I have these course planning documents that you're gonna have access to. I'll show you where. So you've got the alignment chart. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. The module organizer, again, it's like a lesson plan, but I've seen a lot of faculty convert this into like an overview page for their students, really lays out the week for them or the module for them. This is another planning document I like to use. You can see it's divided by weeks. Um, it goes on through week 16 and it talks about not just the module level objective, the assessment, you know, what's the accountability there and then the aligned activities. This is for you to design the course, not for you to give to students. Um, although you could, I don't, I think it would overwhelm them, but um, this is for you to make sure when you're designing, you are being, you are aligning your um, components. So, just to wrap up, we talked about resilient teaching, <laughs> resilient pedagogy. We need to plan for that disruption. We really do. Even though it might not happen, and I really hope it doesn't happen, but we need to plan for it. We talked about learner support. We talked about alignment and backward design. 
And then we talked about a little bit about engagement and interactions. So it's a lot to take in. And an online course is a lot of information in this webinar. <laughs> I'll put this up in just a moment, but let me just show you real quick in the references and resources section, you have the top link that those course design documents or those planning documents I just showed you, it's gonna be linked and Denise will share this with you. I'll, I'm gonna get this together by the end of the day today for you all. Um, uh, one, two, three, four, fifth one down, Pedagogies of Care. Has nothing to do with a lot of what I said today, but is brand new, it came out yesterday, I believe. It is a free, um, resource for you, very well uh, researched group of faculty in there, faculty developers and faculty in there talking about humanizing online learning and, and remote instruction. And then the second to last bullet, Resilient Teaching MOOC. There is a MOOC on this Resilient Teaching Pedagogy and how to create these Resilient Teaching plans, way more than what I did here today, but it's free. Uh, I think it's from University of Michigan. And I enrolled in it and haven't done anything in it, but it just came out about a week or two ago. I'm pretty sure you can still get into it. So look at, and usually MOOCs, you can get into for whatever. Look into that too. Okay. So there's my Twitter handle if you need me or my email address. Um, and I'm at 1201 and I'm ready to take more questions <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I am going to get the information to Denise by the end of today, and I think she's going to send out, no, 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 you'll find, Denise, correct me if I'm wrong, you'll find the presentation and the recording where you found the register button for this workshop. That's correct. So the register button will go away. This workshop will go down to the bottom of the page as a, you know, one that's already been presented, but instead of the register link, there will be a link to the recording and whatever resources you want to share. Someone wanted that, I think of. I'm sorry we didn't get a large chance, moment to talk, but um, if you have questions now, I'm willing to let you turn on your mic and talk to me. <laughs> Are you going to send these notes to us or not? I will link them on our webpage um, in the same place where you registered for this um, webinar. And I'll put that link in the chat. I just put that in the chat. Okay, so. Someone asked if I was gonna, sh if they can share this with their colleagues. Yes, feel free to share this with your colleagues. It's fine with me. Could you provide an example of an Easter egg in a lecturette? Yeah, so um, I would a I'd ask the students a question, kind of like a discussion question, um, where they have to apply the content. And then maybe they would have to email me the answer, or possibly I would create a discussion board, maybe a multiple choice question, and I would create a discussion board, and the only thing they have to put in the discussion board is the answer. And the an and you know, of course, in those discussion boards, you want to put limit where they cannot see each other's posts until they post first. Um, so that way, you know, you ask them the multiple choice and then they have to go to the discussion board and put it in there. And then essentially what happens is the students who haven't found the Easter egg because they haven't listened to the lecture yet, they're like, oh my goodness, what's happening in the discussion board? <laughs> um, there's one there and I can't access it, but it's asking me a question about some lecture and then they go back to the lecture and watch it, and, you know, put it in there. Some people offer that, you know, once a week for a point, a participation point or an extra point or something like that. I like the idea of giving them a more thoughtful question and having them email me the answer. And, but it clouds your email, I realize that. Hey Josie, it's Michelle Mackey, I enjoyed this today. Thanks Michelle, good to see you. I'm, dri I'm driving so I can't chat. Okay. <laughs> okay, so someone said, I prefer using the checklist instead of putting the information in the module overview. I use both. I put an overview and then I go back and I do a checklist at the end. I use, we use D2L. And so I use the checklist tool in D2L, but you could put it up as a Word doc or create your own file or whatever it is. Um, I do both. I really do. I mean, I feel like I know it's redundant, but I mean, just set them up for the plan for the, for the whole um, module. And then I like it at the end because it kind of helps them remember what the deliverables were. Thank you, Josie. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Uh, curriculum alignment worksheet, Candace. Uh, 
I created that with a few of my colleagues who were at Kansas State. I used to work at Kansas State. There are four of us that created that. We made it, you can have it, you can redo it, you can sell it. No, don't sell it. <laughs> Run with it though, it's all you, remake it. You'll have access to it on that, on that link, so. And if you can't get what you want off of that link, just let me know and I'll, I'll send it to you any other way. Um, but yeah, all of us are, have left KSU except I think one of the four. Um, so our names are on there. You probably recognize people if you know people from KSU. Let's see. Thanks, Samuel. I'm trying to scroll up to look at some questions. Someone said, how do you design the exam? Yeah, so that, I, if you're still on, um, <laughs> I've never taught a course like math where there is um, the need so much for that, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, exam, where I, you know, talk to my faculty who teach in STEM and I understand their need to have a proctored exam and I support them if that's the route they wanna go. But I also offer them opportunities for doing more formative assessments along the way before, instead of just offering three exams that are proctored. Um, because you know that sends a significant message to a student. It says, um, you know, basically the only way you're, I'm gonna measure your learning is through these exams that I'm gonna watch you and record you on. And basically, puts that feeling of angst and anxiety and doubt in our students before they even perform in any other way. So I talk about more about doing formative assessments uh, with those types of courses and then uh, maybe a proctored exam, but really giving them the opportunity to do the feedback and get the feedback from practice um, as much as possible. Um, we use a tool called Respondus to proctor our exams. It is not foolproof. There are a lot of problems with it, um, technology and other issues with it, but um, Respondus is what we use. There are others out there. Um, some people have even proctored on Zoom. I think that would be very difficult to do, but it can, is doable. You know, if you Google proctoring on Zoom, you will get um, feedback on it as now COVID times feedback on it, which is what you need. So I hope that answered a little bit of your question. <laughs> Deborah, this is my, you can ask Denise, this is my personality when I'm not stressed. So I'm glad it went well and came off like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Carl. Great, great. Good to hear, Christine. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions, then um, we, we can, yes, that's right, Elisa. Respond this, there's a lot of technology issues uh, with it, not just Chromebooks, you know. It, and, you know, I think that like, that's another hurdle that I feel like we're gonna be um, pretty well aware of when it comes time, you know, for the fall and even the summer, like we're way more prepared for those types of things now than we were in the spring. Um, even though, you know, pockets of us knew about those respondus issues the campus knows about now, so. Well, Josie, thank you so much for this. Um, you're seeing in the chat how many people really appreciate this, and we really appreciate this. You have always been one to jump in and volunteer your time and expertise for a system um, happenings and around inst institutions around Georgia, so we really appreciate your willingness to, um, to do this for us, so thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a lot of information, but <laughs> you can contact me if you want to talk privately about it. Thanks, Denise. I appreciate it. Thanks.